This, this. All of his co workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Stanley went around touching every little thing in the office, but it didn't make a single difference, nor did it advance the story in any way. No matter how hard Stanley looked, he couldn't find a trace of his co-workers. Stanley came to a set of two open doors. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, and Stanley knew it perfectly well. Perhaps he wanted to stop by the employee lounge first, just to admire it. Ah, yes, truly a room worth admiring. But eager to get back to business, Stanley took the first open door on his left. Stanley was so bad at following directions, it's incredible he wasn't five years ago. Now, Stanley, you've nearly gotten all of the Figler and the Reeves. Very soon, you'll collect the last one. The number, and that will be it. We'll be different people by then. Different in the sense that we used to have none of them. And now, we have them all. You can't go back to when you had no Figler and the Reeves. None of us can. Stanley had not gotten himself so far off the beaten path that it seemed the office had begun to drop so far off the beaten path that it seemed the office had begun to drop so far off the beaten path that it seemed the office had begun to drop so far off the beaten path that it seemed the office had begun to drop so far off the beaten path that it seemed the office had begun to drop so far off the beaten path that it seemed the office had begun to drop so far off the beaten path that it seemed the office had begun to drop so far off the beaten path that it seemed the office had begun to drop so far off the beaten path. That it seemed the office had begun to drop so far off the beaten path. 
that it seemed the officer begun, shall sit far off the people. That it seemed the officer begun, shall sit far off the people. That it seemed the officer begun, shall sit far off the people. That it seemed the officer begun, shall sit far You didn't think I was actually just a recording, did you? What a silly and trite explanation that would be. All the back and forth between you and me, all the absurd adventures we've been through, and it all turns out I'm just a tape recording? It was all just in Stanley's head. I bet that's the kind of twist you think is revelatory. I bet each and every time you watch a movie where it turns out all to be in the main character's imagination, you must absolutely bolt off the couch in pure shock at the phenomenal and intricate storytelling. It must be so simple to be you. Life being an unending waterfall of surprises and delights. How much more exciting you must find the world than the rest of us do. Ah. Now I've become sad. Look what you've done to me. This is all your fault. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. No matter how hard Stanley looked, he couldn't find a trace of his co-workers. Stanley went around touching every little thing in the office, but it didn't make a single difference, nor did it advance the story in any way. Stanley clicked on literally every single door in the office because he doesn't pick up well on cues from his environment. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room and Stanley knew it perfectly well. Perhaps he wanted to stop by the employee lounge first, just to admire it. Wow, yes, this room. What a beautiful room. What a but eager to get back to business, Stanley took the first open door on his left. And so he detoured through the maintenance section, walked straight ahead to the opposite door, and got back on track.
Stanley stepped into the broom closet, but there was nothing here, so he turned around and got back on track. Coming to a staircase, Stanley walked upstairs to his boss's office. But Stanley just couldn't do it. He considered the possibility of facing his boss, admitting he had left his post during work hours. He might be fired for that. And in such a competitive economy, why had he taken that risk? All because he believed everyone had vanished. His boss would think he was crazy. And then something occurred to Stanley. Maybe, he thought to himself, maybe I am crazy. All of my co-workers blinking mysteriously out of existence in a single moment for no reason at all? None of it made any logical sense. And as Stanley pondered this, he began to make other strange observations. For example, why couldn't he see his feet when he looked down? Why did doors close automatically behind him wherever he went? And for that matter, these rooms were starting to look pretty familiar. Were they simply repeating? No, Stanley said to himself, this is all too strange, this can't be real. And at last, he came to the conclusion that had been on the tip of his tongue. He just hadn't found the words for it. I'm dreaming, he yelled. This is all a dream. Oh, what a relief, Stanley felt, to have finally found an answer, an explanation. His co-workers weren't actually gone. He wasn't going to lose his job. He wasn't crazy after all. He thought to himself, I suppose I'll wake up soon. I'll have to go back to my boring real-life job pushing buttons. I may as well enjoy this while I'm still lucid. So, he imagined himself flying and began to gently float above the ground. Then he imagined himself soaring through space on a magical star field, and it too appeared. It was so much fun, and Stanley marveled that he had still not woken up. How was he remaining so lucid? And then perhaps the strangest question of them all entered Stanley's head. One he was amazed he hadn't asked himself sooner. Why is there a voice in my head dictating everything that I'm doing and thinking? Now the voice was describing itself being considered by Stanley, who found it particularly strange. I'm dreaming about a voice describing me, thinking about how it's describing my thoughts, he thought. And while he thought it all very odd, and wondered if this voice spoke to all people in their dreams, the truth was that, of course, this was not a dream. How could it be? Was Stanley simply deceiving himself, believing that if he's asleep, he doesn't have to take responsibility for himself? Stanley is as awake right now as he's ever been in his life. Now, hearing the voice speak these words was quite a shock to Stanley. After all, he knew for certain, beyond a doubt, that this was in fact a dream. Did the voice not see him float and make the magical stars just a moment ago? How else would the voice explain all that? This voice was a part of himself too. Surely, surely, if he could just... He would prove it. He would prove that he was in control, that this was a dream. So he closed his eyes gently, and he invited himself to wake up. He felt the cool weight of the blanket on his skin, the press of the mattress on his back, the fresh air of a world outside this one. Let me wake up, he thought to himself. I'm through with this dream. I wish it to be over. Let me go back to my job. Let me continue pushing the buttons. Please, it's all I want. I want my apartment and my wife and my job. All I want is my life exactly the way it's always been. My life is normal. I am normal. Everything will be fine. I am okay. Stanley began screaming. Please, someone, wake me up. My name is Stanley. I have a boss. I have an office. I am real. Please, just someone tell me I am real. I must be real. I must be. Can anyone hear my voice? Who am I? Who am I? And everything went black.
This is the story of a woman named Mariella. Mariella woke up on a day like any other. She arose, got dressed, gathered her belongings, and walked to her place of work. But on this particular day, her walk was interrupted by the body of a man who had stumbled through town talking and screaming to himself, and then collapsed dead on the sidewalk. And although she would soon turn to go call for an ambulance, for just a few brief moments, she considered the strange man. He was obviously crazy, this much she knew. Everyone knows what crazy people look like. And in that moment, she thought to herself how lucky she was to be normal. I am sane. I am in control of my mind. I know what is real and what isn't. It was comforting to think this, and in a certain way, seeing this man made her feel better. But then she remembered the meeting she had scheduled for that day, the very important people whose impressions of her would affect her career, and by extension, the rest of her life. She had no time for this, so it was only a moment that she stood there, staring down at the body. And then she turned and ran. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Stanley came to a set of two open doors. He entered the door on his left. Coming to a staircase, Stanley walked upstairs to his boss's office.
Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. Shocked, unraveled, Stanley wondered in disbelief who orchestrated this, what dark secret was being held from him. What he could not have known was that the keypad behind the boss's desk guarded the terrible truth that his boss had been keeping from him. And so the boss had assigned it an extra secret pin number, 2845. But of course, Stanley couldn't possibly have known this. Stanley just sat around twiddling his thumbs. Trying to input anything on the device was useless, since he could never possibly know that the combination was 2845. Two, eight, four, five. Eight. Eight. Forgot, but it turns out that the panel's emergency override kicked in, and the door just opened all by itself, and Stanley got the hell along with the story. Well, whoop de do. Descending deeper into the building, Stanley realized he felt a bit peculiar. It was a stirring of emotion in his chest, as though he felt more free to think for himself, to question the nature of his job. Why did he feel this now, when for years it had never occurred to him? This question would not go unanswered for long. Whoops, nope, uh, never mind. Stanley actually got back into the elevator and went back up. Silly me. Why did Stanley do that when he knew that it would just lead back to his boss's office? Well, that's a great question. I just can't wait to find out. Here we are, Stanley. It's your boss's office. Exactly the way it was before you got onto the elevator. It's still just exactly what it is. What a decision you've made to come up here and look at the office again. This has fleshed out the plot of the story in new and fascinating ways I could have never anticipated. It's that keen eye for storytelling that you have. An incisive rapid fire of critical plot points, one after the other, weaving a rich tapestry of uncompromising narrative. Wow. <laughs> I'm bolted to the edge of my seat. Eight. Eight.
Incredible. Now he's getting back into the elevator and going down again. Ladies and gentlemen, how does he keep coming up with all of this? Surely this time Stanley will walk forward into the spooky corridor, won't he? Did you think we were going to go forward down the spooky corridor? No. It's time once again to go back up in the elevator. I can't even begin to grapple with what might be up there. Is it the boss's office again? Or what if it's the boss's office this time? The suspense is killing me. Oh my god, it's the boss's office. <sighs> this absolutely changes everything for me. Give me a time out here for a minute while I process this. Okay, I'm ready. I'm prepared to embrace this stunning revelation and to move forward with... No! No, wait! No! I need more time to process. I have fully come Eight. to terms with it. I have made space in my worldview for this astonishing new reality. As before, I turn to your expert eye for gripping narrative, Master Stanley. Of course. Going back down in the elevator. How did I not anticipate it? I mean, sure, now it's obvious, but you have to understand that 30 seconds ago, this kind of thing had never been attempted before. I had no frame of reference to even anticipate it. That's just how revelatory Stanley's decision-making is. A breath of fresh air in a landscape of storytelling that has grown stale and repetitive. You know what? I've just thought of something. Hold on, let's stop for a moment. Don't you realize? It's the anticipation, Stanley. You and I, we have no way of knowing what will be at the top of this elevator. But the suspense, the agony of waiting and anticipating and having to guess, that's the real thrill. Oh, I simply don't want to let that feeling go. It's so precious, so fleeting. Why don't we take this elevator ride nice? and slow. There we go. Isn't this so much more exciting? You know, Stanley, it seems like nowadays the only thing that audiences want is to be shocked as loudly and frequently as possible. They want big, explosive moments flung right in their faces from the very moment that things get started. But where's the tension? Where's the trust in the audience to build a slow and nuanced appreciation for We're the trying to build it now! Us? Why aren't we given time to imagine the surprises? To have to think and to anticipate and then to marvel at the eventual reveal. This is storytelling, Stanley. What you and I are doing right now. This is the most exciting narrative to be developed in years. And it's really all because of you. You're the one who took this bold step of revisiting the exact same locations over and over. Truly, I mean it. 
This is unique and different. It's not like anything else out there. You see, I want stories that surprise me, Stanley. I want to have to think. I want to be engaged and not pandered to. We're being fed such unimaginative drivel all the time, and we all know it, which is why we're so starved for content that makes us feel sharp and vital and alive. That's why people like you so much, Stanley. Because you're not afraid to spit in the face of tradition. You're a role model, you know. People look up to you. Which is why, though I didn't know when to spring this on you, but, well, I've gathered a little press conference for you. So that you can talk about your work and your storytelling and your life. Yes, I know you're not much for the public eye, but I thought it would especially mean a lot to the people who have been following you from the beginning. They really look up to you, Stanley. I don't know if you realize the impact you have on them. This is the kind of gesture that might leave a tremendous impact on them for the better. Oh good, we're here. Okay, the room where we're holding the press conference should be just around the corner here somewhere. Yes, here it is, just through this door. All right, are you ready? I've told them you're going to speak a little bit about the nature of surprise in storytelling and what it means to craft a truly unpredictable narrative. Oh, don't worry, you'll do great. Just be yourself and speak from the heart. I'm, I'm really proud of you, Stanley. Okay, it looks like they're ready for you. Go get them. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Stanley clicked on literally every single door in the office because he doesn't pick up well on cues from his environment. Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, and Stanley knew it perfectly well. Perhaps he wanted to stop by the employee lounge first, just to admire it.
The lounge was sublime, a work of art. What was it about this room that called so deeply and so personally to Stanley? Its grace, its subtle charm? No. Stanley knew it was something deeper, something darker. Yes, really, really worth it being here in the room. A room so utterly captivating that even though all your co-workers have mysteriously vanished, here you sit looking at these chairs and some paintings. Really worth it. But eager to get back to business, Stanley took the first open door on his left. And so he detoured through the maintenance section, walked straight ahead to the opposite door, and got back on track. I'm not going to encourage you. I'm not going to say anything at all. I'm just going to be patient and wait for you to finish whatever it is you enjoy doing so much in this room. Please take your time. Coming to a staircase, Stanley walked upstairs to his boss's office. Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stuck.
This is different. I've never been here. Seven fifty four. I wonder if this is where the other uh, figurine thing is. Okay, that's the uh, that's the main room where you start. My office is just around the corner there. So I'm on the other side of the wall. The windows that are white. Yeah, same thing. Same room, red door shut, elevator is locked, up the stairs, 758. Seven fifty nine. This is changing, but the room's staying the same. Seven fifty nine. the heck? That was weird because this door is never open, but because they did that office, this door opened. I wonder if there's other spots like that. All this oh, co workers were, were gone. gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. No matter how hard Stanley looked, he couldn't find a trace of his co workers. See, this is the room. You'll see 432 here. So when I was going up the stairs, I was on the other side of this window. That's pretty neat. If I do it with the bucket, the good old Just stand me on the bucket. Off on another thrilling adventure together. Stanley clutched the bucket tightly to his chip. This was not the correct way to the meeting room. 
But Stanley had felt the bucket calling to him, telling him that the employee lounge was simply the place to be. And here it was. Had the bucket turned out to be correct? Was this better than the... No, never mind. The bucket was wrong. Stanley took the door on his left to go back, and so the two of them detoured through the maintenance section and walked straight ahead to the opposite door. Stanley, we must move on from this broom closet, simply because I have no remaining stickers. If I did, you can guarantee we'd be in here for hours. But alas, no stickers. Coming to a staircase, Stanley and the bucket walked upstairs to the boss's office. Stepping into his manager's office, Stanley was once again stunned to discover not an indication of any human life. Crushed by the weight of this revelation, Stanley may have broken down into an emotional dumpster fire if not for the soothing presence of the bucket. Even now, in his darkest of hours, did the bucket's warmth and guiding light pierce the dark clouds of confusion and chaos. It would be with him always. The bucket. Two of them were insane. At this point, Stanley was so absorbed in the tender spiritual connection he shared with the bucket that he didn't notice the keypad behind the boss's desk. Nor in his bliss of simply being near the bucket did he have any notion that the pin number for the keypad was 2845. I'm not in the boss's room. I left it. Like Stanley just sat around twiddling his thumbs, trying to. Oh, look at one of you. 